Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in a, in a webinar series by the National Weather Service and the National Integrated Drought Information System on strengthening the Weather Service Drought Toolbox. Today, we're going to be talking about assessing drought in a changing climate. And so in today's webinar, we're really excited. We've got a, some great stories to tell both at the national scale as well as some case studies from some specific regions and weather forecast offices. So we're gonna kickstart today with a, an overview on the state of the science on how drought assessment is changing. And that will be from Joel Lisenby from the NIDAS program. We'll then switch over to get some perspectives from the National Weather Service on monitoring and communicating drought and a changing climate and how things have changed, especially in the Western region. And then finally, we'll dig in a little bit to attribution and uncertainty. We'll hear from Andy Hoyle from NOAA's Physical Sciences Lab, and then we'll wrap it up um, from some perspectives in Southeast Alaska from Brian Brett Schneider. So we'll be happy to answer any questions or comments for you. Just enter it into the question box in the GoToWebinar uh, toolbox and we will answer those at the end and so what we'll go ahead to do right now is move forward i do see that you are seeing the full screen let me see if i can go ahead and sh change the way my here we go there we go thank you for pointing that out so we're going to go ahead and get started and i'll pass it over to joel Thank you, Meredith, and hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, and as I go through my slides, you're going to see on almost every slide that I borrowed some of this material or adapted it from someplace else. Uh, what happened was back in uh, back in late February, early March, NIDAS held a a workshop about drought assessment in a climate, changing climate. And in February, the part of this the this workshop that happened in February, we had a three hour long webinar where we asked experts from around the country to talk about how uh, to talk about drought non-stationarity and what i've done for this presentation is i went through that three hour webinar and i pulled a few pieces of material that i think tell the story pretty well and then i added in some content from the latest um national climate assessment so what we're looking at here are three different ways to think about stationary and non-stationary climate so the top left is a stationary climate where your your central tendency isn't changing over time but on the top left, you have a linear trend, something that's just increasing monotonically. On the bottom left, you've got a step change. Uh, we usually see step changes when we see an instrument change. They're not, we, they're not always or they're not often a naturally occurring or physically occurring feature in our climate, but we see them often when we're looking through the data. But we also can see a, a shift in variability. And so there's another way that we can, another way that we can see uh, a non-stationary climate is where things become a little bit crazier as time goes on. Go ahead to the next slide. So I'm gonna just do a quick tour around the country. This is some content that I pulled from Art Nicotano's presentation, but I adapted it a little bit for this. This is looking at some trends in precipitation over the Northeast. And this is pulled from the climatesmartfarming.org uh, tool. And you can see on the left, this is changes. It, it's precipitation trends from 1950 to 2013. And then on the right is from 1980 to 2013, so a shorter period. And we can see almost across the board that, that the Northeast is getting a little bit wetter over time. Now we need to think about that. What does that mean in terms of drought? If a place is becoming generally wetter, what does drought look like? Does it still look like it did? in the 1950s or the, in the 1930s. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, in addition to precipitation, we're also, oh, oh, this is looking at just one county in Pennsylvania. This is Susquehanna County. And we can see how the trend in precipitation changes depending on the reference period that we use to define uh, that, uh, that climate. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so this is now, instead of looking back at historical observations, this is looking ahead at climate projections. And we've got precipitation, on the left and we've got potential evaporation on the right and just generally looking at these we've got wetting in almost all seasons but more so in winter and we see an increase in evapotranspiration uh, toward the late century go to the next slide so in addition to changes in precipitation and and evapotranspiration we're also seeing changes in snowpack trends in the northeast so uh, just very generally we're seeing fewer days that have snow of specific depths 
throughout the Northeast. We're seeing more winter precipitation coming as rain instead of snow. Go to the next slide. Now this is looking at the other side of the country now, the west and the southwest. This is a slide that I pulled from Andy Hoyle, who we're going to be hearing from later in this webinar today. And uh, um, the, the, the time series in the middle, that's looking at soil moisture across the southwest US, and that's defined in this, in this slide as the states of California, Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. Um, then on the right, we see the difference in precipitation from 2000 to 2020, and comparing that to 1920 to the year 2000. And below that, we're seeing the same time, time frame, but looking at temperatures instead. So in general, across the West, we're seeing less precipitation and increased temperatures when comparing those two time differences. And looking at soil moisture, we can see a, a few big ups and downs or notable ups and downs. Looking at the, the decade of the 1980s, late 1970s and 1980s, we saw a wet enough period that the soil moisture stayed saturated for quite a while. But then we look back at like the 1930s, the 1950s, uh, even the 2000s and 2010s, we see long periods where the soil moisture stayed low. So we see a lot of variability, even if we're seeing these over the, these long-term trends in precipitation. Go to the next slide, please, Meredith. So what does that mean for things like the hydrology in the region? This is looking at the Lake Powell pool elevation from when Lake Powell was built and finished in 1963 and started filling up. And this takes us up through, uh, I think this was up to last week that I, I grabbed this data. And the, the parts of this time series that are in blue are where it's increasing brown is where it's decreasing. There's a few interesting things that we can pull from this. Uh, I mentioned where, that in the 1980s, soil moisture stayed pretty wet across the West. We can see during the, the decade of the 1980s, Lake Powell hit a peak. In fact, it almost overflowed in 1983. An interesting story where the Bureau of Reclamation had to go and they, they were like drilling plywood across the top of the dam to try to keep water from overflowing. Um, but then we had a few prolonged drought periods. We had a, a bit of a drying period in the late 80s, early 90s, but then it, it refilled again. But then we saw this major drawdown beginning around the year 2000, that really picked up in around 2002 and it's it stayed low um so it, it hit a low point in about 2005 and it never really recovered we had another pretty intense drought period in the year 2000 to 20 and 2021 and then we had this crazy wet year last year with one of the record high snowpacks but it still wasn't enough to bring us back to the pre-drought levels that we saw um before the year 2000. go to the next slide now this is an image from Oh, let's go for, forward. Uh, there we go. This is an image that I pulled from the fifth national climate assessment. And this is looking at the, the, the outlined area in the, on the map is the upper Colorado River Basin. So this is the area that would be filling Lake Powell. And on the bottom, you can see a time series of the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry. And this is uh, adapted to represent natural flow. So like, what if we didn't have a dam right above Lee's Ferry, what would the river flow look like uh, right there? And we can see that around the, the 1910s, or 19 teens and 1920s, the, the Colorado River flow was relatively high compared to the whole time series. And this was when the Colorado River Compact was signed, and this was when the size of the dams of Lake Powell McNeed were determined, and people decided to dam up that river. But then we had a drought period and things really dropped off in the 1930s and they never really recovered. And so now um, in, you can see the, the map on the right, the 2000 to 2009 period when the Colorado River shortage guidelines were written, it, it was sort of looking back and saying, wow, the, the variability across this region was such that we first wrote the Colorado River Compact when the Colorado River was high, but it, that was probably an odd uh, an oddity in the climate of this region, and it, it influenced the policy that was put in place to frame the Colorado River. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is another slide that I pulled from Andy Hoyle. This is looking specifically at the 2020 to 2021 drought, and the time series on here and the maps are averages of this, um, what is it, a 20 month period? Yeah, a 20 month period across, uh, and we're looking just mostly at the, the Western United States. Uh, this was one of the driest periods on record. In fact, when you're when you're looking at the average of that whole 20-month period, it was the driest 20-month period uh, 
on the, of the historical records that we have in the southwestern United States. And when you compare that with any drought periods and you line that up with the temperatures, we see that it's, it was the hottest drought period that the Southwest had ever seen. Uh, so we saw this crazy hot, crazy dry drought uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, going to the next slide. Um, this is from a report that, that NIDAS published with, uh, with the, the drought task force, uh, the fourth drought task force. Um, uh, it, the, the lead author was Minkin, so the, the reference is Minkin et al. 2021, but the, the scientist that put together this analysis was Isla Simpson, and so I wanted to acknowledge her and, and the work that she did to put this together, and I borrowed these slides from her. And what we're looking at is um, some annual mean, so each dot is an annual mean, and it's precipitation along the x-axis and a vapor pressure deficit, which is a, a, a measure or an approximation of how much evaporation you're going to see in the atmosphere, and that's up the y-axis. And uh, these are just the years from 1950 to the year 2000. And you can see that, it, that most of the data is sort of clumped together, but generally we can see on drier years, you tend to see higher vapor pressure deficit. And on wetter years, you tend to see less because that sort of makes sense when you have a lot of precipitation, you'd also see a lot of cloud cover and lower temperatures generally. Go ahead and, and click the button once. We're going to see what happens when, oh, and. So the dots are observations and the shaded rings are model-based probability. So looking at uh, multiple model runs from 33 different Earth system models, um, all together representing 1,683 years of simulations, we can look at what are the probabilities that, uh, that the precipitation vapor pressure deficit intersection would fall within this range. And we can see that the model lines up pretty well with the observations, there are a few odd outliers, but mostly they line up pretty well. Go ahead and click the next to the next slide. So now I'm showing the same thing, but this is observations for the next time period down the road. So it's the, the last 20 years from, uh, from the year 2000 to the year 2020. And we can see that the precipitation hasn't changed that much, but vapor pressure deficit has risen over that period. Go to the next slide. Now we're seeing the same thing with the modeled probabilities and the observations line up pretty well, but 2020 was is this outlier. 2020 had both the lowest precipitation on record for, well, within the records shown here, and also had the highest vapor pressure deficit by a pretty high margin. In fact, it fell outside of the modeled probabilities. Go ahead to the next slide too. So we don't have future observations yet, but we can look at modeled probabilities for the period from 2030 to 2050 to see how does precipitation and vapor pressure deficit line up in a warmer future climate. And we see that that finally encompasses uh, the year 2020. I think click one more to finish out this slide. Yes, okay. So basically the, the takeaway from this was that the drought period from 2020 to 2021 could not have happened in a pre-2000 climate. It wasn't warm enough. And it is more analogous to the sorts of droughts that we're likely to see in the Western United States for the year for, for the period of 2030 and beyond. Uh, and this is a, a pretty important thing to think about as we're looking at what does drought mean in a, an already arid region? Well, we're seeing droughts now that are hotter and drier than any droughts we've seen in the past. And the models suggest this is most likely to become a new normal when we're looking at drought. Go ahead to the next slide. I'm going to cruise through some of these pretty quickly. These are all from NCA5. This is just a, a quick look at projected changes in annual actual evapotranspiration by mid-century. Century. So this is looking at a similar metric to the vapor pressure deficit. It's how much evaporation are we seeing from um, uh, uh, pulling water out of the landscape. And we can see that parts of the east are getting, uh, are seeing, um, uh, an in, what would that be, an uh, increase in actual evapotranspiration. So if it being actual, there's more water to evaporate. Southwest is drying. Go to the next slide. Okay, so this is changes in average summer soil moisture by mid-century, and we can see that just generally across the board, we're seeing a, a decrease, or ex we can expect to see a decrease in the soil moisture. Go ahead to the next slide. So I mentioned this shift in variability, and the model suggests that we are going to see this in parts of the upper Midwest. Uh, well, and generally up, across a lot of the country, but this is the image that I was able to pull from NCA5. Um, that uh, under a high emission scenario, so that's that SSP 5 to 8.5, we see that what we're looking at here is the frequency of precipitation extreme transition. So how frequently does the climate go from a dry period or a drought to a wet period or a flood? 
and we can see that that frequency increasing um, with in in a warmer climate. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so with all of this that I've shown, it raises a question, well, how should we be assessing drought, especially where climate is changing? Should we be using all available data knowing that there's strong trends in the data and the past won't be representative of the present or the future? Go ahead and click the button once. Or should we be using a shorter or modern reference period that's more representative of a contemporary climate, knowing that extreme events like the Dust Bowl of the past might be ignored? And go ahead and click one more time. Uh, or should we be considering a paleoclimate record to get an idea of what's physically possible in the location we're looking at? And go ahead and click again. I think these are the wrong questions. What we should be asking is when should we be using the whole data set? When should we be using a shorter record period? And when should we be using paleoclimate data? And this all depends on what your applications are. Why are we assessing climate in the first place? And that's that was the main question that was asked in this workshop on the topic that we held earlier this year. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so there's a picture of everybody that showed up to that. It was February 28th and March 1st. It was held in Boulder, Colorado. We had a, 110 participants, plus or minus. I mean, some people came and went. And we were looking at this question from four different perspectives. We at this point we were really looking at what what are the physical under what how what's the physical understanding that we need to be thinking about when it comes to drought in a changing climate? Next slide. Um, so we recently published a report on the things that we talked about at that workshop uh, that came out last week, and you can find it on drought.gov. I think it still is linked from the homepage. It's like the big banner that you'd see when you land on it. Um, the takeaways from this workshop were that we came across 15 focus areas where future investment can help answer these questions. And I don't have time to show all 15, but I grabbed five that I thought would be re uh, relevant to this group. Um, they're here. We, it's important that we understand drivers of aridification and their interactions with drought. We need to ensure equity in drought monitoring and assessment. We need to determine the physical drivers of drought and how they're changing. We need to address regional differences in non-stationarity. And we need to use precipitation effectiveness more broadly to capture the rainfall variability. So precipitation effectiveness is, uh, there's a different, there are a few different me measures of this, but it's things like what is the ratio of precipitation that seeps into the soil compared to that which runs off? Um, some, the, the, the soil seepage is effective for agriculture, it's really useful, but runoff is really good for uh, things like reservoir storage. So there's, there's a, uh, Understanding that ratio better is an important way for us to capture that rainfall variability. Uh, anyway, next slide. I think that's my last. Uh, I went through that pretty quickly. Uh, I'll pass it back to Meredith. Great. Thank you, Joel. Again, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and put it in the question box. I'll now turn it over to Aaron Peters, who's the Hydrology Program Manager at the Weather Service Western Region. All right. Thanks, Meredith. Uh, welcome everybody and thanks for having me this uh, afternoon. Um, so uh, I'm just going to caveat, I am the HPM for Western Region. Uh, I've been in this job not all that long and prior to that I was the Senior Service Hydrologist in the Great Falls Montana Weather Service um, uh, Forecast Office and so I was there I was heavily involved with the local drought program and also some national drought stuff. So that's kind of where my frame of reference comes with respect to drought. And we can just uh, go ahead and jump into the first slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, you know, where we're at with the Weather Service um, and how our interactions with partners are going um, and where we need to go uh, when assessing and monitoring drought. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was how and why the National Weather Service role in drought is important. Um, and that's really because the National Weather Service is a key player and partner in almost every single state's drought response framework. And in many cases, they facilitate vital parts of the state's response. So, and you know, a, a reason for that is really shown in map form on those two images, images on the right. We have weather forecast offices scattered, you know, in every nook and cranny of the United States. Plus we have uh, river forecast centers, uh, you know, located more regionally. And, so those field staff in those offices are on the front lines of drought assessment at the local, state, and regional level. Um, and they're ingrained with their partners in drought assessment and monitoring, and they are highly involved with it at, at every level, really. Uh, of course, long-term National Weather Service records, such as the co-op network, are vital to drought monitoring and research, particularly in a changing climate as we things see things changing see, you know those long-term records are critical for seeing you know how the changes are, are occurring compared to the past 
Um, and of course, the drought space is a perfect example of how IDSS um, or impact based decision support services can be executed to improve our relationships with those local and regional partners and help them execute their missions as well. All right, uh, next slide. Okay, um, I just want to, this is, I'm going to go through this, this is just from another slideshow, but I thought it kind of highlighted, um, you know, why it's so important that we do have local folks, uh, you know, kind of in those offices making, helping make these local decisions, because there are huge differences in how um, different regions of the country um, look at drought, from duration to what indicators they look at, what time scales they look at, what the magnitudes of drought are in those regions, the seasonality, um, you know, a season, a magnitude and seasonality of a drought in the West is completely different than it is in the Southeast. So having uh, what local folks in the Weather Service involved in these decisions and helping their partners make these, uh, you know, assess and monitor drought um, is, is, is super important. Next slide. Okay, so how has uh, drought assessment changed? And um, so I'm going to talk about sort of like a, a local example. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm originally from Montana, and that's kind of where my you know biggest frame of reference comes from. But as I think a lot of this stuff can be kind of projected out into many other parts of the country. So as we see the climate changing, we're seeing more extreme precipitation events. We're seeing flash droughts. That's something. You know, flash drought is something that we didn't talk about even you know 10 years ago, and um, so something that really came from the 2017 flash drought in Montana is that we completely changed our process for assessing and monitoring drought uh, as a state. And I think a lot of states are kind of grappling with this or, or regions even. Um, you know, how do we take what's happening with our climate and, and adapt to that when we're monitoring and assessing drought? So what, what kind of happened in Montana is prior to 2017, there was one person that was taking the, the lead for the entire state uh, and assessing drought for the U.S. Drought Monitor, and it quickly became apparent, and they were doing it on a like a biweekly or, or even monthly time scale. Which um, by the time the 2017 flash drought hit, uh, we realized quickly that that was not going to work. Uh, we needed to be meeting and assessing drought on a weekly basis. We needed to be we needed better tools. We needed better spatial and graphical tools to do this, um, and we also needed more people. So. It was not feasible for one person to take over, you know, to to uh, assess drought on a weekly basis for the entire state. So what we did is developed a drought task force. We have there are five people that rotate on a basis and communicate um, with the U.S. Drought Monitor by assessing and collecting information for the entire state. So each one of those people takes two weeks stints, and so you get less burnout. Um, and another positive of kind of that rotating uh, liaison method is that um, you reduce some bias. So you've got people to check you and also, you know, you get a different perspective every two weeks on a different person, you know, kind of assessing the situation. So another big thing that came out of the 2017 uh, drought was this dashboard that you're looking at. So the state of Montana Climate Office. Um, develop this dashboard which basically brings together all the drought information that you might want to look at on a weekly basis to assess what's going on in your area and of course it's only valid for the upper missouri basin um, and the northwest part of the country right now but they are looking to expand it there's been a lot of um, you know, uh, interest in getting expanded across much of the west and the rest of the country but the cool thing is you can overlay all these different layers at different time scales and really Look, it's a one-stop shop for everything you need. And that was huge when reducing workload, when on assessing drought on a weekly basis, um, because you didn't have to go to seven different websites and, oh, what was that? You know, what are, what are we looking at? What did we look at last week? And this is a great way um, and something we found super valuable uh, in order to assess drought in Montana. Uh, next slide. So one of the things, um, and this applies to to anywhere that something that we you know I think a lot of us have realized is that we can no longer re rely solely on precipitation deficits or surpluses to inform our assessment. So if it you know it's not just if it rains we're going to improve and if it doesn't rain we're going to degrade. Um, we really are using as as an agency trying to encourage folks to use a holistic approach to include anything from evaporative demand, snow water equivalent, soil moisture, vegetation health, stream flow. And you use all of those things to come up with a depiction of what you you know think is going on. 
And these are just uh, more screenshots from that dashboard, but um, you can get this information, you know, in many different places for wherever you're at in whatever part of the country. Um, but it really does take that holistic approach and, you know, assessing all of the indicators at once to come up with a picture of what is going on. All right, uh, next slide. So one other kind of shift that we've seen over the last, you know, five to 10 years is a shift away from just pure, pure data driven decisions to also what do our partners need to make their decisions? And uh, it might not just be precipitation data or, you know, weather data. And we at the Weather Service are already set up, you know, in our model to help our partners make these decisions. We can learn their thresholds and their challenges and their impacts, and we can incorporate these things into our drop messaging. And because, you know, our partners are already feeling the effects of climate change. They know it's happening. They can see the changes, but they don't necessarily know how to make decisions based on that. And, you know, I think we're all learning this together. And I'm not saying any of us have the right, you know, have a silver bullet, but we can, as an agency, help our partners make these decisions better. And all, all across, you know, industries that are affected by drought, including water supply and agriculture, energy production, tourism, conservation, all of those things, and many more, of course. Um, and that is something that has seen a shift, um, you know, since uh, we've seen, you know, the changes that drought has had due to our changing climate. Next slide. All right, so um, how do we continue to adapt our approach? So these, these plots are actually from Montana, but I think, you know, we don't necessarily need to think about location, but just kind of look at what the changes we're seeing. So June, July, and August are getting drier, but maybe March, April, May are getting wetter. What does that mean? And what, how do those changes in seasonal precipitation and temperature affect different regions of the country? Um, that's going to be, you know, some conversations you'll have with your partners to try to figure out what that means for them and how you can help them when messaging and assessing drop. And also, you know, what metrics are better to use if in the winter versus the summer, the warm season versus the cool season. And there's a lot of research going on to improve assessment on a seasonal scale right now. Um, you know, there's no, again, huge silver bullets yet to figure, figuring that out. And I think it's going to be very hyper local and, you know, or regional on how that plays out. But that's another thing we need to consider when we are adapting our approach into the future, because these, these projections, of course, are for 2040 to 2069. So they haven't happened yet. They may not happen exactly like these plots show, but we do know that we're gonna to continue to see changes and we need to be aware of those and kind of prepare to adapt our approach. Next slide. So one of the big things um, the National Weather Service has done uh, is a, it was a huge effort um, to modernize our drought information statement or the DGT. And this is a huge um, action item that came out of our 2021 Western States Drought Workshop. And um, so basically the feedback from that workshop was, was overwhelming saying that we need to be able to modernize this product and not just, you know, jot a few things down in text that nobody looks at. We need graphics, we need impacts, we need outlooks. Um, and so, uh, these are just a few screenshots of a portion of the drought information statement for Northern Arizona that is out currently. Um, so it just shows that we went more from a text-based product uh, to a like a PDF that shows up on drought.gov and you can include anything that's customizable per office um, and region. You can include all the things that your partners, your local and regional partners need to know. And as we all are already discussed, Folks in the West may need to know different things than folks in the Midwest or the Southeast or the Northeast. So these are highly customizable. There's lots of templates um, and it was a kind of a huge monumental shift for drop messaging and communication within our agency. And uh, it's pretty exciting. It got rolled out here in the last um, six months or so, uh, if I remember right. And you know we're still kind of you know getting used to doing this, but a lot of the offices have really taken it and, and made it their own, which is really awesome to see. So that's a huge improvement. Next slide. Okay, so um, looking at into the future, um, I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly because I know we're short on time. Um, monitoring, so of course, in, increased institute monitoring is always needed and it's greatly beneficial. Um, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers is increasing the uh, um, uh, network of 
weather stations in the upper Missouri basin by like 500 stations in the next five years or 10 years or something like that. And that's amazing. But we also have to realize that we're not always going to be able to increase monitoring like that. And so we have to le leverage other sources of information like remote sensing, um, you know, where data is sparse. And of course, data is very sparse in the West as compared to the East. So we're really looking at that and saying, how can we leverage these things that aren't necessarily in situ to help us inform our decisions? And of course, we all want better forecasts, right? So, um, and that's something that our port partners are always asking for. Um, one of the things that kind of was mentioned in that uh, drought workshop in 2021 that we did is that CPC is looking at moving their drought outlooks towards more of a probabilistic product, similar to all their other products. And that would really help communicate uncertainty because that's uh, an important aspect of this is communicating what's happening, but also the uncertainty about what might happen. Um, also, increased collaboration between national centers and the RFCs and WFOs to better message potential drought conditions. So um, one thing that is happening is that Western RFCs are currently working with CPC to improve subseasonal to seasonal forecasts using HEFS, the hydrologic ensemble forecast system, um, for precipitation and temperature for operational use. So that's, that's huge. And these are things that we're actively doing and working on and, and we'll hopefully we'll continue to, to work through over the next several years. All right, uh, the next slide is just a highlight, uh, um, some highlights. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm, it's, I've already talked about all this. So this is kind of like, just serves as a, as a, as a bullet point list for the, for the um, to be posted on the website. So I think that's my last slide and my um, email's there if anybody wants to contact me after this. Thank you so much. Excellent, thank you, Aaron. And we'll also post um, at the end, we'll share with you a webinar recording that we did on the um, modernized drought information statements that you mentioned. Okay, now we'll pass it over to Andy Hoyle. Andy, all yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Meredith. And yeah, thanks everybody for attending and for the organizers for asking me to speak today. So what I'm gonna discuss is how attribution studies inform drought early warning. And I'm gonna focus principally on attribution studies that look at the climate change effect on individual droughts, um, because after all, attribution studies can be a little bit more wide ranging, um, ranging from trying to understand how to predict a given drought and so on and so forth. So if we move on to the next slide here, uh, what I'll outline here is the purpose of an attribution study and what our intended outcomes are. The first is really to diagnose the characteristics and causes of a drought. And this is really placing a drought into the context of historical records in order to better understand how that drought behaved and how it was unique compared to others. In terms of causes here, these causes may include climate change and or natural effects. And this is really important here because it gets down to what are the physical mechanisms that drive a drought and how can we leverage that information to be able to anticipate the next drought, whether that be something like El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is uh, obviously very important to droughts, especially in the Southwest, or to climate change, as uh, Joel um, summarized so nicely, in that climate change may be altering droughts in the way we perceive droughts. Now, when we perform an attribution study, we like to think that we do them just because they're interesting but uh, that's not true. We actually wanna have some outcomes that um, have some tangible benefit on society. The first one being, we wanna be able to support the early warning of future droughts. We wanna be able to take the lessons learned from an attribution study and be able to say something about what the next drought will bring or the drought after that. And then another example here is to provide context to evaluate drought response. So droughts in, at the state level, and you all know this very well, there's an evaluation of drought response and what could folks have done better to respond to that. And using the information here about what we knew when we knew it to be able to evaluate how we can do better in terms of drought response the next time. So let's move on here to the next slide. And how are these uh, studies conducted? So in terms of a climate change effect, we tend to look at it in terms of detection and attribution. You'll see these two terms used a lot when it comes to assessing the effect of climate change. What I'm gonna do here is really just run over a case study or the, the sequence of slides that follow to give an understanding of sort of what we do at a thousand foot level. I think one thing to really note here is that droughts a phenomena that consists of many different facets and physical features each of which may respond to climate change a little bit differently. So what that means is that the conclusions of an attribution study may depend on how the study was conducted and the physical features assessed. 
So for instance, if you were to look at precipitation solely as your drought metric, you may have a little bit different of an impression as you would if you looked at like a soil moisture runoff or reservoir level. So that's a caveat here that one needs to consider in trying to construct an attribution study um, focused on climate change. Now, in terms of the two facets of these kinds of studies, the first one being detection, what we hope to do is we hope to identify the characteristics of the of a drought in observations of your drought metric, and then develop hypotheses for these causes, whether these hypotheses be principally in terms of like a natural cause, like an El Nino Southern Oscillation, or if that maybe have something to do with the effect of climate change. And then finally, there's the attribution part, where what we're trying to do is we're trying to test what the our hypotheses are. And we tend to use climate models when it comes to the attribution facet of, um, of these kinds of studies. The first is we want to test the robustness of the characteristics that we've identified using climate models. How representative are those characteristics of the actual behavior of drought within a region? And I'll get into that a little bit more in terms of uncertainty in the following slides. And then finally, when it comes to testing those hypotheses using climate models, that is placing the observed history within the context of these climate models to be able to say something meaningful about what caused a drought. So if we move on here to the next slide, what I'm going to do very quickly here is to illustrate a Southeast Alaska drought attribution study that we did. And this, this drought spanned 27, 2017 to 2019. On the left is the precipitation percentile rank during this 24-month period, and this is relative to a period of 1925 to, uh, to 2020. Same perspective, but for temperatures is on the right. Uh, this data is based on NOAA and CEI climate um, uh, county and county um, equivalent data. On the left, what we're seeing here is very low precipitation compared to a historical record uh, over Southeast Alaska. And the lowest precipitation in a two-year period over some parts of those areas. So it was exceptionally dry. On the right, it was also exceptionally warm. And it was exceptionally warm statewide. And also over that Southeast Alaska region, where we're looking about the 80th percentile. So this was indeed a hot and dry drought. So moving on to the next slide here. What, what we do here is we're going to show this in terms of precipitation and temperature, these two variables in attributing the effect of climate change. This is a little bit of a simplistic view, but it's just to give an, give an understanding of what the kind of work that we do here about trying to place these effects in terms of climate change. This is the time series of October to September precipitation based on NOAA's NCEI data over Southeast Alaska. And it, the thousand foot view, it's very difficult to see any sorts of trends in here. The variability from one year to the next is exceptional. And in fact, one decade to the next. The drought that is of interest to us, you can see in those two data points near the end of the record that are very low compared to average. The third lowest on record was 2017 to 2018, and 2018 to 2019 was among the lowest on record. So all told, putting those two years together brings that made up the lowest two-year total in the historical record that we showed in the prior slide. Now, what we do here, and moving on to the next slide, is to place the observed history into the context of climate model simulations. This right here is based on 38 CMIP-6 simulations for Southeast Alaska. That's shown in terms of the thin gray lines. Now these thin gray lines, they all show very different evolutions of the climate over Southeast Alaska, which are plausible representations of how the climate could have behaved. What we do is we try to aggregate some some features that are generalizable across all of these simulations. And we tend to do that by taking the average of the simulations, which isolates the effect of prescribed forcing, which is anthropogenic within the models, that anthropogenic forcing being changes in aerosols, changes in carbon dioxide and atmosphere composition. That model average is shown in the pink line. You see that pink line really straddles zero. You don't see much in the way of changes throughout the period. If you squint really closely, what you might be able to see is a little bit of an increase toward the end of the record. Well, but that's not statistically significant, it's not very large. So from this, 
it really gives us the impression that the observed precipitation that we saw in that two-year drought was not caused by climate change, but rather by natural variations. If we move on to the next slide here, what we do is we try, we try to make these um, systematic comparisons. So what are shown here are histograms or um, probability density functions that show how likely a certain outcome was to be within a past in a recent climate. The recent climate being 1991 to 2020, that's the orange curve, in the past climate being 1931 to 1960. As you can see here, precipitation lays on top of one another in a comparison between those two 30-year periods, which indicates that climate change did not have an effect on precipitation. Now, moving on here to the next slide, now we'll do the same exercise, but for temperature. <laughs> so this being the temperature time series, you can see a very dramatic increase in temperatures between the earlier parts of the period and the later parts of the period. And that right there, one would suspect would be a climate change effect. We do note that there are some up and ups and downs from one year to the next that are on the order of about a degree and a half or two degrees Celsius from one year to the next, but that does not really account for the really stepwise change between the later and later parts of the period, the earlier parts of the period. Now going to the next slide, what we do is we take our climate model simulations and we overlay them in the context of our observed history. And then we take the average. Well, you can see that that average, which is the pink line, there's been a very large increase um, since about 1980, which tracks actually pretty closely with that of the observed history. The observed history has a lot more variability, obviously, but there are systematic increases in both. That right there, at a thousand foot view, would indicate that climate change is leading to that increase in temperature outside of the variability that we see that is, that is somewhat natural. So moving on to the next slide, what we do here is we take the histogram or the probability density function, if you, if, if you like that terminology, and we compare them between 1991 to 2020 and 1931 to 1960. Well, there's a, a, a systematic shift uh, to warmer conditions in the later period compared to the earlier period. That right there isolates the effect of the prescribed forcing in these models, which is what we're trying to get at is, which is anthropogenic, which is the climate change effect. So pretty strong attribution statement there that climate change did indeed increase those temperatures, whereas it did not with precip. So moving on to the next slide, I will leave this, uh, well, I'll, I'll let this linger here. I know we're running low on time and I'll pass it back to Meredith. Thank you. Excellent. This is actually a really good segue because we are going to wrap up uh, today's speakers with a presentation from Brian um, from Weather Service in um, in Alaska, and he's going to be able to build on and add a little bit more context to the case study that you just presented. So, Brian, all yours. All right. Thank you, Meredith. And um, so, yeah, so I guess mine will be complementary to what Andy was just saying, because my case study is the Southeast Alaska drought. Uh, so my name again is uh, Brian Bretschneider, and I'm the um, Climate Services Program Manager for the National Weather Services Alaska region. And we, of course, cover Alaska. So uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. And just real briefly, and, and this, this is kind of stating the obvious, but really until about five years ago, we never really talked about drought in Alaska. And so we've spent kind of a couple of years all kind of looking at each other and saying, well, what is drought in Alaska? We don't have agriculture to speak of. Um, you know, we don't have, we don't, we don't have a lot of the concerns that, that, um, that the people in uh, lower latitudes have. And so, uh, you know, asking different people, you know, what drought means to them is, is, is an important kind of starting point that we're, um, that, that we've we've just gotten the ball rolling on the on the last few years, right? So, can we have drought in Alaska when it's 30 below zero in Fairbanks? Well, maybe. So again, it's something we're just starting to get our our hands wrapped around. Next slide. And, and to do this, we have uh, in partnership with um, uh, the USDA and the, and the Climate Hub and and some others, um, University of Alaska Fairbanks, kind of held some some workshops around the state, talking with uh, local people and asking them, you know, what their concerns are, what their, um, what drought means to them and, and what, the, what the impacts are locally. 
Next slide. And to, um, you know, again, to follow up on, on the previous presentation, we really want to focus on what drought is in Southeast Alaska. So, so to, to step back, when we, you know, when you talk to folks in, in Fairbanks or the interior, drought is very much connected to, to wildfire. Um, in some other parts of the state, it is about um, water supply because most communities, uh, especially rural communities, have a um, you know a pond or a lake that they that they draw water from for their for their uh, water supply. And in southeast Alaska, it's a little bit different because this is a rainforest. This is the wettest region in the United States. I, I mean, there's there are a few wetter spots, say in Hawaii. But as a region, this is the wettest region in the United States. Ketchikan gets 150 inches of rain a year. The Yakutat gets 150 inches of rain or precipitation per year. Uh, Juneau, one of the drier spots, gets six, about 65 inches of precipitation a year. So, you know, this is this is a rainforest. And can you have a drought in the rainforest? And I think if you had asked people this five or ten years ago, they would have said, you know, there could be wet periods and dry periods, but you really couldn't have a drought. Next slide. Well, guess what? They did have a drought, as Andy mentioned. And <clears throat> there's there's a couple of components to that. And it's it's more than just the precipitation values. And, and Andy noted that um, it it fell into the category of, of natural variability, but but that's only part of the story. And so, you know, when we talk about drought, we, we really are talking about impacts. What is this lack of precipitation mean to a region. And in Alaska, in Southeast Alaska, uh, you know, fishing is king. Fishing is the largest employer, uh, or as far as uh, sectors of employment, it is the largest uh, statewide and including Southeast Alaska. Um, and it's also important culturally for subsistence, uh, for, you know, putting, uh, putting food in the freezer. Many, most, or all of Southeast Alaska is off the road network. You can only get there by, by boat or by airplane. And so having uh, low precipitation means low amounts of water in the streams. It means low discharge into the, uh, the estuaries and the near shore waters. And it's uh, highly impactful. So next slide. And the, the, the case study I wanna talk about is the community of Metlakatla which is on uh, which is the southernmost i believe the southernmost community in alaska on uh, annette island it's um a uh, pr predominantly native alaska community and actually there's a uh, there's an upper air weather uh weather uh, balloon launching site there um p-a-n-t and it's um actually it's the i believe it's the only uh, reservation in alaska where they opted out of um, some of the provisions of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. But in any event, they get their power, like many communities in Southeast Alaska, from hydroelectric. And so this is this is where really the nexus is for a drought impacts in Southeast Alaska. It's not so much wildfire, it's not, it's not agriculture, it's it's hydroelectric, uh, in, in addition to what I just mentioned about um, uh, in-stream flow and, and fishing. Next slide. So Metlakatla, they get there, and the city is on the, the near the lower left there. They generate hydroelectric power from Purple Lake, which sits at a, an elevation of about 400 feet. And again, this area gets uh, 100 or to 150 inches of precipitation a year. But the timing is very important. We saw some slides and other presentations that showed projected increases in much of the year, but projected decreases in other times of the year even though there's a net increase, uh, the, the timing really matters. And in particular, the uh, the timing of snowfall and the amount of snowfall matters. Next slide. So this is a, a map I put together showing the, the trend in snowfall over the last 50 years. And really all of Southeast Alaska has a uh, significant decrease in snowfall. And this is primarily driven by the increase in temperatures, right? So as you as you uh, you move temperatures higher up, higher, 
just a smaller fraction of the, uh, the, the total precipitation falls as snow. So even if you, let's say, even if there's a no change in precipitation, maybe they still get 100 inches a year, but instead of getting, I'm just gonna make up some numbers here, instead of getting 50, or instead of getting uh, 80 inches of snow a year, maybe now they only get 40 or 50 inches of snow a year. And of course, uh, in mountains, that is, is significantly different. So when we look at, if, if, if we go back a slide, can you go back a slide? Notice how these, this lake is ringed by mountains, right? And, and you can even see that uh, without that green coloring, that's, that's above tundra, that's above tree line. And these areas get tremendous amounts of snow in the winter. Well, I should say they used to get tremendous amounts of snow in the winter. They get less snow in the winter now. And so Metlakatla, area their dry season is june july or may june july august so this is the area this is the time of the year where uh where relatively little rain falls and so the um the contribution then to the lake is from snowmelt just like uh, you would see in parts of california or nevada or the southwestern uh, contiguous us so we really are depending on melting snowfall to maintain that lake level in the summer so that they can generate electricity. But with much less uh, winter snowfall, we now have this uh, deficit of a runoff in the summer months, which means we can no longer reliably produce um, uh, electricity in all seasons. So let's go forward, I guess, two slides. And if you see, if you look back to, this is uh, the U.S. Drought Monitor from August 2019, you can see that red area in the deep uh, or, or in, the, in the extreme southern end of the state. And we also see some red in the south central part of the state, in, in the Anchorage area where I live. Uh, but there's a huge difference here, is that in, in much of the rest of the state, drought is, can, is typically very... Um, uh, it it, it, it uh, develops very quickly and it can go away very quickly. But here in, in, in the southeast part of the state, this is a long developing drought um, and it takes a long time to, uh, to uh, overcome the deficits that were accruing over you know, an 18 or so month period. So in, in the Anchorage area, this drought went away in about six weeks. Uh, in southeast Alaska, it took about six months eventually for it to finally go away. Next slide. And if we look at this is this is something that I think can be a little bit confusing to a lot of people. So over the over a 12 month period from July 2018 through June 2019, this is an area that got say, you know, 60 to 70, even 75 percent of their average annual precipitation. And that that sounds dry, but it doesn't sound excessively dry. But if we go to the next slide, for all July through June periods, this was easily the driest on record for almost all of Southeast Alaska, um, or at least for this 83 year period. So, so you know, in, in areas of parts of California or Nevada or Utah, you know, 60 or 70 percent annual precipitation is dry, but it's, it's not noteworthy. But here, um, precipitation is typically much more consistent. And so having 60% of your annual precipitation uh, is pretty much gonna put you in the driest year on record. And that's exactly what they, what they experienced. Next slide. And you can see here, here's the 20 year time series from, uh, from the US Drought Monitor. And you can see that for basically a two year period, uh, and this is for the Southern Panhandle, um, climate zone uh, in that encompasses the Ketchikan Metlakatli area. You can see again about two years of drought, um, with almost six months in um, in in D, the D3 D4 category drought. So just very very um, very very noteworthy. Next slide. I'm almost done. The National Weather Service in Juneau did a lot of outreach. There were a lot of news stories, but they actually they they sent 
you know, Aaron, the rock, uh, not Aaron, Aaron um, Jacobs, the service hydrologist, and others down to Ketchikan and Metlakatla, lots of community engagement, lots of meetings, um, lots of outreach, um, but not just here's, um, not just telling people what's going on, but listening to people uh, about what their uh, concerns are and, and understanding what the impacts are. Next slide. And we also engage with our partners um, in the uh, in the, our NOAA RISA at the University of Alaska Fairbanks um, to uh, to engage a, a larger group of people uh, in in, uh, in a virtual setting uh, to not only provide information on the state of the drought but also uh, what people's impacts are. And then finally, just last slide. I think it's you know again kind of. Uh, when we talk about attribution, you know, we're, we want to, as, as Aaron, I'm sorry, not Aaron, um, as the previous presentation had mentioned, you know, it, it, even when a, a dry period falls within the range of natural variability in terms of the precipitation amounts, um, in this case, because of the warming temperatures, um, the snowfall decrease, uh, which is a critical for those summer uh, flows into the lake, uh, is definitely has a climate change attribute with the with the warming temperatures, higher freezing levels, lower proportion of overall snowfall fall or precipitation falling snowfall. So I, I'm pretty sure I've run out of my time. Thank you, everyone, and um, feel free to reach out with any questions. Maggie, passing it over to you. Great, thank you, Meredith, and thanks to all the speakers. We just have a few minutes left, so I have uh, one question for each of the panelists. So uh, for Brian and Aaron, who talked about a drought and a change in climate, sort of in a regional, local scale, I wonder if you could share um, what you think the most important tool or scientific advances for um, making better decisions or messaging drought in a changing climate. And as you're thinking about that, the other question that came up for our, our other panelists, Joel and Andy, are about uh, land use change. So um, could you share uh, any tidbits about existing studies linking Western drought and aridification to land use change and in particular to changing uh, grazing patterns in in the last decades. So maybe starting with um, with Brian and then Aaron uh, back to the um, most important tool for their region. Well, I think this is Brian. I think from a from a monitoring monitoring perspective, the um, you know the the U.S. Drought Monitor um, products have have really been extremely helpful in being able to communicate to um, to communities and and um, and our our partners. Kind of what the state of, of things are right now, because when you walk into the rainforest, you just it, no matter if it's very wet or very dry, it basically all looks it looks the same all the time. And so having these monitoring tools really is is really critical for uh, for helping people keep tabs on the state of the environment. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Aaron. Your thoughts? Sure. I, I it's a it's a this is a tough question, <laughs> but. I think, <clears throat> at least in in my region in the West, um, like Brian said, of course the U.S. Drought Monitor is is a huge tool that we all use. Um, but I think that also for for us here in the Western United United States, the U.S. Drought Monitor doesn't always depict, you know, hydrologic uh, long term drought in the way that our partners uh, see it. So I think leveraging both U.S. Drought Monitor products and um, you know, like River Forecast Center, uh, long-term guidance, and, you know, um, working with those hydro partners that see drought on a decadal scale rather than, uh, you know, a yearly scale even, and um, being able to, you know, work coincidentally with both of those because they're both ha happening at the same time. Um, and that's not really a product or a tool, but it's something that we are working actively to do better at. And I think we're we're making head headway with that. With NIDIS's help, you know, having more of a holistic approach with uh, multi-agency um, folks doing all the same thing and communicating those those different 
differences in what drought actually means in the West. Thanks, Aaron. And so finally, uh, to Joel and Andy, um, do you have any uh, thoughts to share about the, the links between drought and climate change and land use change? Yeah, I can take a stab at it. Um, it's a fantastic question. And honestly, it's one of the next frontiers of being able to attribute climate change. Um, and the reason for that is because these land surface processes that are really important in terms of the feedbacks between the atmosphere and the land of moisture and, um, and heat, they aren't well simulated in model simulations at the scales that we tend to look at climate change. And obviously, if you don't have those processes, you really can't make a very firm statement about what those effects are. You can do a little bit more targeted studies, and I think that is where our community is going. Because it stands to reason that if you're going to change the land surface characteristics with land surface change with with land use change, then you're obviously going to change some of those processes that are very important. So that's just my two cents. It doesn't really give a satisfactory answer, but it is a, an emerging frontier that I think our field is going to be focusing on quite a bit. Thanks so much. So thanks again to all of our speakers today. This is really a, an important topic and uh, something that uh, we'll hear more about drought in a changing climate. Uh, Meredith and I wanted to remind you that this is the third in a series of five planned webinars and we're working on the dates for the next two, um, but actually the next one will consider some of those key drought indicators for your region and we're also planning a webinar focused on drought messaging. So hope to see you then and also uh, the uh, mm -hmm. webinar recordings for the previous webinars are available both at drought.gov and uh, on our Weather Service Climate Services site. Thanks again. See you soon.